Hi, I'm John Harden. Hi, I'm Yuya. And we are Ice Cube's Winter Rubbers. We've been living and working at the South Pole for the last 11 months to take care of Ice Cube and make sure it stays up and running. Hello, and welcome to the South Pole. What you're seeing here are the colors of our stunning sunrise, which happens just once per year. We're sorry we can't be with you live today, but due to how the satellite works, it is actually very difficult to stream consistently. In this shot, we've gone a little bit back in time. In the foreground, you can see the flags of the signatories to the Antarctic Treaty flapping in the wind surrounding the ceremonial South Pole. In the background, you can see the station, which we'll get to in just a minute. And even further back, you can see the moon, which looks a little bit yellow because the shot is so exposed, but it is the moon, I promise. You see here an aerial view of the station and surrounding area. In the upper left is Ice Cube. To the right are CMB telescopes, and there's the dark sector road leading out there, which crosses the skiway. Skiway is where the planes land. The station proper is at the end of that road. It's the E with four legs coming off of it. Three of those legs are used for sleeping and birthing, one of which is the gym, and the long side of the E is where general station activities take place. Off to the right, out of frame, is our clean air sector, and near the front of the frame, is the backyard, as we call it, which we use for logistics, storage, whatever you can think of. It's the biggest freezer in the world. We're going to get to see a little bit of the inside of the station now. What you're seeing here is the galley, which is sort of a central gathering point for all kinds of people. And what you're seeing right now is actually you and I getting ready to talk some stuff over and prep for our trip out to the ICL. The galley is actually a wonderful place. The staff there serves us delicious food of huge variety, and there's always something to do and somebody to talk to there. In the summer, there are more than 150 people on station sometimes. In the winter, there are just 42. But the galley always comes through and everybody gets a meal. And indeed, we even do special events for holidays and other things. It, it's actually really nice when you're down here and you're missing your family. Oh, and there are always cookies available whenever you want. which can be unfortunate. Sometimes they're a little bit too available. The galley is ringed by windows, as you can see here. And anytime there's even a little bit of light outside, we have the covers off. And we can actually see the sun moving horizontally. It would move from the right to the left in this frame. When there isn't any light outside, we have aurora cameras up top of the station. And so we can't have any light spilling out onto the snow and interfering with that experiment. So we actually cover the windows. Um, other things in the galley include this main table where we sit. And in the back, you can see the galley scroll, which tells us important things about the station. Right now, it's telling us that the internet isn't currently up, but will be soon. And it can also tell us things like the temperature. And as you may have heard, it can get somewhat cold at the South Pole. We've decided what we want to do, and now it's time for us to gear up and get ready to head out for the day. Uh, to do that, we put on our ECW, or Extreme Cold Weather Gear. You can see we've already started with the iconic Big Reds, and we're putting on our balaclavas and hats and gloves and boots in order to minimize the risk of cold injury. Uh, the temperatures you saw there are no joke. You can get frost nip on exposed skin in less than five minutes. So we have to make sure everything is covered, and it's covered and well and well insulated. One of the main reasons we go out and brave the cold here at the South Pole is to support our science, which goes on at our outbuildings. The science is divided into several sectors, first of which is the clean air sector. We also have the quiet sector and the dark sector. The clean air sector is used by NOAA, and it is upwind of our power plant. It has some of the cleanest and most well-mixed air on the continent and even the world. They can measure all sorts of contaminants, and they can even measure CO2 levels on the regular going back decades. The quiet sector minimizes vibrations used to monitor seismic activity, and the dark sector includes Ice Cube and the Cosmic Microwave Background Telescopes, and we try to minimize radio wave interference. So let's head out and take a look at the dark sector. As we exit the station, we come through the so-called Hercules door. All exits to the station use this heavily insulated door so that we're not wasting heat. We have a finite amount of fuel here at the South Pole, and we don't want to waste it. 
All of our electricity and heat down here comes from burning the jet fuel that we get called AN8. We go through several hundred thousand gallons a year, most of which is dragged here in bags on what is called the Traverse. The Traverse is a 900 mile tractor pull from McMurdo all the way to South Pole Station. As we start our walk to the dark sector, you will see two kinds of snow. On the right is what we call groom snow, relatively packed down, nice to walk on. On the left is ungroomed snow, snow that the wind has been shaping for quite some time. And what forms in ungroomed snow are called sastrugi. Sastrugi form because the ice crystals that form this top layer we're walking on like to stick to each other, and when they do, they shape the wind that goes around them. So the interplay between the stickiness and the wind produces these curves and overhangs and nice features which are beautiful to look at and all kinds of fun to trip on when it's dark outside. As we walk out to the dark sector, we will cross the skiway where the plains land. And when we do, we will be on top of Ice Cube. To give you a sense of scale of this detector, the ICL over on the left there sits in the middle of it whereas the cosmic microwave background telescopes on the right are just about two-thirds of the way to the edge of the detector. All in all, the footprint is around a square kilometer. Now don't worry, we're not going to be hurting anything. There's a mile of ice between us and the top of the sensitive part of the detector. Below that, it extends for another halfway to the ground. And seeing as we're almost two miles up here, that's an incredible amount of ice. But up here on top of the ice, as we saw earlier, it can get quite cold. It isn't just the raw temperature making things cold, although, you know, that contributes, but the wind. The wind can really be worse, because what it can do is it can find any crack in your ECW, get in, blow around, and just make stuff cold. Usually it's the cheeks or the bridge of your nose or the brow that this is a problem for, and it's especially a problem when you have to walk directly into it. But it's also a problem because it will pick up the top layer of snow and it will really reduce the visibility. And when the sun already isn't shining, then this is an extra problem. Now, in this, we have to walk about two-thirds of a mile from the station to the ICL, and this can take anywhere from 10 minutes on groomed snow on a bright summer day to 20 to 25 if it's bad visibility and we're climbing over Sestrugi in the dark winter. Typically, we have to do this two to three times a week for general maintenance, but sometimes we have to walk out on incredibly short notice, or even in the middle of the night, if something went wrong at the ICL and it needs to be fixed immediately. Usually, we're just bringing ourselves out there, although also our cameras, typically. But occasionally, we have to bring a piece of hardware to or from for debugging or other sorts of fixing. If we have to do anything more substantial than that, which is pretty rare, we would like to use a vehicle. Because if you have to carry anything heavy outside, you end up compressing your glove, which gets rid of the outer layer of insulation of air, which is a recipe to get cold fingers very, very quickly. Here we are in the bottom of the ICL, where we maintain an electronics lab. Spares are limited here at the South Pole, especially during the winter, so we have to be able to repair whatever we can. I'm sitting over there on the right, repairing a card that allows us to talk to the DOMS, whereas Yuya is over there on the left repairing the power supplies to the DOM hubs, which are the computers that allow us to integrate all of the data from the DOMs. What we see here is the DOM itself. To give you some idea of it, it's about a foot and a half in diameter. The entire lower half is used just to collect light. The upper half has some sensitive electronics that we use to both power the pixel and to determine if it's seen any light whatsoever. The cable that you see coming out of there is how it talks to the surface. Let's move upstairs to our control room. We maintain a room with a couple of workstations next to our main server room for when we need to do pure computing-based tasks, but we don't want to be near the noise of the servers themselves. On the left, you can see Yuya checking in with the terminal application, and we both have our live monitoring of the system up. The live monitoring makes sure nothing goes out of sorts with the network without us knowing about it. And if anything critical happens, it will page us so that we can fix it as soon as possible. And here we are in the server room. 
the beating heart of Ice Cube. What you see behind those red wires there are the DOM hubs. Each of the DOM hubs is responsible for one string of DOMs, and on each string of DOMs are 60 DOMs, so each DOM hub manages 60 DOMs. The DOMs communicate with the DOM hubs through these red wires, 15 of which are used for each string. We call them quads because each red wire manages the information of four DOMs. All of those DOMs go into the DOM hubs, which are all networked together, and importantly, they're all networked to our processing farm. And the processing farm is very important because it allows us to determine from moment to moment if anything interesting has happened. Now, if you're an ice cuber, the word interesting means if we've seen an astronomical neutrino, typically. We see about one of those per month. And when we do see them, our processing farm not only lets us know that they've happened, they let us know what energy they happened at and which direction they came from, down to about a degree. And then we can email the north, and if anybody with other kinds of telescopes want to follow up on it, they can do that. Now, this brings us to the other important feature of IceCube. It's our uptime. We're more than 99% up, and we're actually a good deal more than that most of the time. It's why Yuya and I have to be on the ball and on call as much as we can to fix it if anything ever goes down. Being up this often allows us to guarantee that we will see whatever happens in space, at least as long as it happens in neutrinos. And one of the most interesting things that can happen in neutrinos is a supernova. And what's especially interesting about that is that we think that the neutrinos from a supernova will come out 15 minutes to an hour before the light of the supernova, which means that with IceCube, we can alert everybody else on the planet that a supernova is about to happen with a good at least 15 minute lead time. And being able to see a supernova with modern technology would just be an incredible scientific advance for us. Although we only see about one of those a century, so we're, we're crossing our fingers down here. Well, that about wraps it up for today, but we wanted to thank you all for being here with us. You and I are gonna be here on this snow drift enjoying the sunrise, but we honestly couldn't leave you without sharing some of the nighttime images that you can see down here. It's a little hard to film properly outside, but you can do a nice time lapse, and honestly, the eye can see these things pretty well as well. The Milky Way viewing and the Aurora viewing are just spectacular. The first time we saw auroras, just after sunset, I called Yuya out onto the roof and we just spent some time staring at them. Thank you for being with us here today, and we'll leave you with this picture of us standing at one of our strings. We mark them all with these tall yellow flags. Thanks again. <laughs>